from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming the mysteries of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or of wisdom, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. My message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of spirit and power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak a wisdom to those who are mature, but not a wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Rather, we speak God's wisdom, mysterious, hidden, which God predetermined before the ages for our glory, and which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and what has not entered the human heart, what God has prepared for those who love him. This God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Verbum Domini. The mouth of the just murmurs wisdom. Trust in the Lord and do good, that you may dwell in the land and be fed in security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will grant your heart's request. The matter of the just wisdom. Commit to the Lord your way. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make justice dawn for you like the light. Bright as the noonday shall be your vindication. The mouth of the just tells of wisdom, and his tongue utters what is right. The law of his God is in his heart, and his steps do not falter. The mouth of the just are Dominus vobiscum, et cum spiritu tuo. Lexio Sancti Evangelii, secundum Lucam. Gloria tibi Domine. Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calcul calculate the cost to see if there's enough for its completion? 
Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlookers should laugh at him and say, this one began to build but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king marching into battle would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops? But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Verbum Domini. Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate the feast of Saint John of the Cross, a Spanish mystic born in 1542, a contemporary and confidant of St. Teresa of Avila. And John of the Cross is most famously known for the poem he wrote, The Dark Night of the Soul. John of the Cross, I think, is so pivotal for us today because we live in an age, a time, a culture, a society, a mentality, that deifies the ego, the me. Father Fred Miller, who passed away earlier this year, who taught at a number of seminaries, especially at the one where I work now at Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, Maryland, used to talk, talk about a new heresy called meology. It's all about me. We live in a world that glorifies comfort. Now, we're not as Christians, we're not as Catholic Christians being encouraged to live austere lives just for the sake of austerity. We don't have to be like the Amish and give up electricity or plumbing or our automobiles or even our cell phones. But what we are asked to do is to be detached from these things. As we heard in the gospel today, Every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. To renounce possessions means they don't possess me, but I will still have things. Unless you take a vow of poverty like our friars here do at EWTN. If you're a diocesan priest, if you're a lay person, you're gonna have things, but we must not be attached to them. And John of the Cross gives us a wonderful perspective. Jesus says, you must take up your cross and come after me. What does it mean to take up your cross? John the Cross found out the hard way when he reformed the Carmelite order that he had joined. He was 21 years old when he came into the community. He was 25 when he was ordained a priest, but he had seen that the Carmelites had become a little too comfortable. And so he started to reform from within, unlike Martin Luther who reformed from outside and threw the baby out with the bathwater. But John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and others reformed within, first within themselves. Yes, he had some austere acts of penance that he performed. We have to remember, you and I are not Spanish mystics in the 16th century, but we are called to be faithful Christians who listen to our Lord and take up our cross. But the cross has been given to us by God. We don't choose it. Now, when we do penance or mortification, it's there for a purpose. We're, we know as Christians that we are called, commanded, to love everyone, even love our enemies. But we're not obligated to like everyone. All you have to do is look at your relatives or your neighbors or your coworkers. Meaning that there are some people that our chemistry is different, our personalities are such 
So I love that person. I want what's good for them. I don't wish evil upon them. But what does it mean when there's some people I don't like or I know don't like me? Well, John the Cross suggests, as do others, we put up with them. That may be more difficult than laying on the floor and not sleeping in your bed or taking cold showers or doing all kinds of other acts of self-denial. If we do those things because we feel we're evil, we need to be punished, that is not our Catholic faith. We're not Jansenists. The acts of self-denial we do are there for a purpose. And if you enjoy your acts of self-denial, then it's not penance, is it? If you enjoy doing these things, especially things that are uncomfortable, that are annoying or irritating, there's something wrong with you. But if I, I do these things for the right reason, I do them because of my love of Jesus, I do it to save souls, the souls in purgatory, I do it to save souls here on earth, those people who are wandering, who have left the faith, who have become lukewarm. I'm offering it up for them. When I was in Catholic grade school, the sisters would tell us this every day. Anytime there was any inconvenience, the air conditioning wasn't working. Well, we had no air conditioning back then. <laughs> if there was eight feet of snow, which often happened in Erie, sisters said, offer it up for the poor souls. We heard it so many times, our eyes rolled to the back of our head, but these were words of wisdom. Offer it up. It doesn't mean you like what's happening. That's the key. Because if you like it, it's not, off, it's not suffering. It's not mortification. It's something that you don't like and you put up with, which could be a person or a thing. You go to the restaurant, they bring in the wrong dish, eat it. It may not be the temperature you like, put up with it. You're at the airport, you're on the plane. Believe me, there's plenty of opportunities for mortification flying these days. They change the flights, the numbers. You have to go to different terminals now. Delays, your luggage, that alone can get souls out of purgatory. You put up with it. And instead of internalizing and becoming bitter and angry, and you don't get to the other end of the spectrum where you go, oh, I love my luggage was lost, yay. There's something wrong with you if you do that. But if you say rather, Lord, I'm offering up this inconvenience, this irritation, this is what true asceticism is. It's doing things for the right reason because I love Jesus. He asked me to take up my cross and there's certain things I have no control over. So I put up with those things. I endure them. It's like a parent who has to wake up in the middle of the night to take care of a crying baby. What parent jumps out of bed and goes, yay, the baby's crying. And then they fight over who gets to go to see. No, you get up, oh, I gotta get to work. The, the kid just cried an hour ago. But they do it because they love that child. And there's many things that a parent puts up with because of that child, because they love that child. It's not just those things that I enjoy, but it's putting up with those things that I don't. And when I'm doing mortification, purposely, this is not a spiritual Olympics. You're not trying to impress God. I remember when I was in third grade, Sister Gertrude was going around the room asking us what we were gonna do for Lent. And of course, being a tragilio, a letter T, I'm at the end of the uh, number system. I was like number 25. So all the good penances were done in the beginning, all the A's and the B's, you know. I'm giving up chocolate, all right? I'm, I'm not gonna watch TV or no Saturday cartoons. It gets to me, I'm, all the good stuff was done. I said, well, sister, I'm for Lent, I'm giving up fighting with my brothers. You can't do that. No, I have to fight with them? No, you shouldn't be doing it anyway, so that can't be penance. So I had to think of something else. Sometimes we do things and we think, God's gonna be impressed. When I was a pastor, or now that I'm in the seminary, and I have seminarians as spiritual directees, sometimes people wanna go on these very severe penances and say, well, for Lent, I'm only gonna have water and bread. I'm only gonna eat once a day. And I would say to some of my parishioners, yeah. And then at three in the morning, I'm gonna get a phone call to come and anoint you because you're in a diabetic coma now. I said, that's not right. How about instead of going too far, because one, you might not complete this, 
You might crash and burn, as we might say, and get discouraged. Or two, if you manage to complete it, it's going to go to your head. Before, look what I did. And God's not going to go, oh, good for you. You had bread and water for, for 40 days. How about getting on the cross for three hours? How about suffering the crown of thorns or the nails? And it may not be the physical suffering, but for some people it is. There are many people who suffer so many torments physically or emotionally or psychologically or otherwise. But rather than trying to impress God by our acts of mortification, we do them for the right reason, to strengthen us. Penance is self-denial I do to engender contrition for my past sins. Mortification is self-denial that I do to toughen me up to prepare me for when temptation comes. Because if I can say no in a little thing, I'm more likely to say no in a big thing. So that's the key, they must be little. St. Therese of the Little Flower tells us this. It's little things done out of love, done often, done with attention that mean the most. So it's not that I'm gonna have on my obituary, oh look, these are all his acts of penances he did during life. First of all, no one's gonna be impressed and that's not why I do them. But the acts that I do, the acts of mortification, the cross I bear, I do it out of love for Jesus. He told me, carry your cross. And he asked you to carry your cross. I gotta carry my cross, not my neighbor's. But we're always looking next door, aren't we? Oh, look, his is lighter than mine. He's got styrofoam, I got lead. <laughs> Well, maybe that he can't bear the lead cross, and you can. I had a brother who had muscular dystrophy, my brother Michael. He suffered terribly from that disease, but it never made him a bitter person. Life was not easy for him, but it was a blessing to have him in our house. And I was always edified by how well he did. He didn't enjoy any of those things that he had to go through. But these were great acts of devotion that he put up with. And he put up with his crazy oldest brother too. This is what John of the Cross is teaching us, that we're not doing this to draw attention, I'm doing this to get sanctified, to get closer to God. And I'm not in competition with everyone else saying, my penance is better than yours. We shouldn't go down that road, but rather encourage and edify not by what we're doing, but by how we're doing it. What's the context? What's the perspective? This means more than having some kind of list to say, Lord, look what I did in life. Look at all my acts of penance. And Jesus is going to say, look at my wounds. Rather, he wants us to be faithful servants who love our Lord, who embrace the cross for the right reason, and so putting up with little inconveniences, like being stuck in traffic. Ooh, that's coming soon, isn't it? All the Christmas shoppers will be out. You're driving around trying to find that one parking space that's left and it doesn't exist. That would be an act of mortification to put up with it. Not that you enjoy not having a parking space, then it's not mortification. But if I put up with it and endure and say, Lord, this day did not start off too well. I stub my toe, all right? I can't find my keys. But I'm gonna offer it up for you. That doesn't mean I enjoy it. What it means is I do it. I persevere. I do this for the sake of Christ. May God bless us and Mary keep us.